Welcome to Mentorship's Moments. I'm your host, Mark Ridley, and today we have two bright young men joining us on the show, Mr. Logan Jackson and Mr. Mark Kez Ridley, who just happens to be my son. So let's jump right in. Gentlemen, good evening. How are you? Doing, Doing well. good. Doing, Doing well. Very great. Thanks well, for having us. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate I'm glad it. glad you're here. So we're going to start with you, Logan. All right. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. A little bit about me, uh, I am from New Orleans, Louisiana, and um, I uh, came out here for filmmaking. This is Los Angeles, California, for people that don't know, so I came out here for filmmaking. Been out here for like a year and a couple months now, so uh, a little bit about me, though, I bounced around quite a bit, so uh, during Hurricane Katrina, we lost it all, so we kind of bounced around from like state to state, to house to house, living everywhere. Could never really find a home, but here in Los Angeles, California, I think I really found a home. I really That's love true. it here. Yeah, they got beaches. We got swamps. <laughs> so, yes, they do. Man. Yeah, so I love it out here. So I understand that you have a film that you just completed or a number of films that you're doing right now, correct? Yeah, yeah. I have uh, quite a few films that I'm doing right now. The most recent one would be uh, Tommy's Log, which takes place in Joshua Tree. It's about a, a schizoaffective guy that's going through these uh, mental trips drug addiction, all kind of things that he's dealing with out there on Joshua Tree. So it's a very trippy film, but the film really touches on schizoaffectiveness disorder. I think we have a clip of that, don't we? Yes. Okay, yeah, let's, let's so. roll that clip and let's take a look at uh, Joshua Tree. What is it? Tommy's Log. Tommy's Log. Shot in Joshua Tree. <laughs> Tommy's Log. Let's, let's roll the clip. You still into Socrates, huh? Yeah, yeah. He's inspiration to me. Always has been. You know, he never documented any of his philosophies, but all those who were close to him kept a personal log about the man. I'm gonna go get breakfast started. Why is this man so arrogant, doctor? What is this painful need or desire we have to know everything? This is easy. What? You seem to be the only one out here struggling with your emotions and sh. So here the f we are. Wow. <laughs> impressive. <laughs> thank Very you, impressive. Thank you. Yes, thank you. it looks like some good stuff there. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, a lot of people like it because it's, it's very different, it's very innovative, it's very creative. Uh, the guy out there, uh, Jordan Lee Brown, who actually stars in it, is a tremendous actor, and he really gave it all uh, on set. So the film raises awareness for schizophrenia, right. uh, an issue that a lot of people overlook, but it's a very serious condition, and I hope to raise a lot of awareness with this film. So let me ask you, what is your passion? Is, you know, is this your passion, or what is your passion? If so, um, tell us how you got to that point. Uh, my passion is creating, is art. And uh, the way I got to that point was actually through tragedy, you know, so different tragedies that happened in my life, especially with Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, right. going through a lot of different things and seeing the friends that I had growing up in poverty stricken areas. I got a homie right now that's just uh, locked up for life for a murder, We're sleeping next to, next to each other. We started this whole film thing together and he's doing life for a murder, you know, so like I can't deal with that mentally. The only way for me to deal with that is for an outlet. So my outlet is to be creative, to use my voice, to uh, do something positive, raise awareness for a lot of different issues. That's the way I cope with things, you know, because growing up, like I said, different tragedies impact the way I shift my uh, creative arts, right. so. Well, I, I, and I wanna come back to that course later because I want you both to you know, talk about those passions and stuff, you know. Yeah. But let's introduce also Marquez Ridley, oh, who yeah. this handsome young man happens ah. to be my son. <laughs> Welcome, Marquez. I'm glad to have you here. Oh, thanks for having Tell me. Tell us a little bit about you. Uh, me, 
as you obviously know, um, I'm born and bred right here in uh, Los Angeles, Southern California. Uh, really raised between just uh, Culver City, LA, and the, the Valley, uh, San Fernando Valley area. Um, so I mean, just like he said, you know, LA, he found a home in LA. This is um, definitely my home. It's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, and it's just an amazing place that has different dynamics and I just don't see myself ever permanently leaving. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you own a business. Yes. That's called L.A. Carporting. That's right? correct. Tell us a little bit about that and what, what inspired you to, to get this business going? Uh, basically, I have to give my cr that credit to my business partner. I mean, um, speaking of passion, um, cars is always something I've been interested in, but it was uh, in the market he works, which is the auto industry, he just kind of found a niche of service services needed for dealerships and for uh, people who work in, in automotive wholesale mm -hmm. and um, brokers, which is very prominent, especially in the SoCal area. Uh, so we found a niche of you know people who needed that service. So basically, um, we just kind of we collaborated to create the company. Um, and basically, what we do is we have a team of drivers that contract with different wholesalers. Uh, brokers and dealerships to help manage their inventory. Great. Now, now doing that business, um, with going back to the passion stuff, does or can your passion make money for you? And if so, how do you plan on promoting it, each of you? You know, let's start with you since you're talking about this. Um, I definitely think so. I definitely think that passion can um, be be cultivated into you know, creating a source of income, you just have to be a little bit creative with it. Um, but also, on the, uh, on the other side, you have to understand what your passion is, because there are some there are some people's passion that that is very limited in in what they can make income with. So, I, and that you have to still have to have a sense of realism, and and what you know whatever your passion is, because sometimes people will find other outlets of making income and, and, and uh, creating a, a business hmm. just so they can live their passion, right. so they can fund their passion. And sometimes in those, uh, taking that route, you find another way to create a business, you know, out of your passion. Right. Well, what about you, Logan? Well, of course, you know, like uh, my passion is filmmaking and, and people come here to Los Angeles and, uh, you know, it's Hollywood. It's the big bucks. People are driven by that. But like, forget money. Right. Money is money is money. They print that every day. You know, like this <laughs> is do. this is what I'm driven by. And it's art. You know, it, it's creating, it's inspiring, it's touching somebody, it's changing somebody's life. You know, that's that's the real riches. So money is money. Yeah, people can make hundred million dollars, you know, on this filmmaking stuff, they could do all that or they can make a dollar on it. But who are you really touching? You know, so that that's that's my motivation, that's my passion. But to answer your question, yeah, you can make a, a lot of money, like, you know, tons of money. What would you each share to the millennials your age group and um, even younger to uh, guide them in searching for their passion? executing it and um, taking it to another level? Well, I would say, to reiterate on what I just said, don't be driven by the money. Don't be driven by the money. Follow your passion, follow your heart. You know, like, to all the kids out there, follow your passion, follow your heart. Don't worry about what nobody say or, or you can't do it or they too scared to do something. You do it. Don't worry about the money. The money's gonna come. Practice your craft, practice what you're good at, what you love to do, and the money gonna come. That's what I always tell my nephews and like whoever, like my cousins, I tell them, follow your heart. Right. And if you do that, my heart ain't never lied to me since. I hear you. Well, you, Marquez? Uh, I, have, I definitely have to agree. I, I think I come at it with a, a little different perspective, at the, but at the same time, it's very parallel with his. Uh, definitely, I feel like you, you do have to follow your heart mm -hmm. and not be afraid. I feel like so many people, not even just millennials, just uh, people in, you know, from from uh, you know the previous generation uh, and generation <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and Generation Z, even right. the even the younger kids, they're they're afraid to pull the trigger. You know, they're so kind of encompassed by fear, just of the unknown. Um, you just have to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you can't be 
you have to get outside of the, the normal social constructs of, you know, go to school, go to college, get a job, because we don't live in that time anymore. We so don't you're live. saying research, you're saying reading, uh, you're saying... I'm saying just acting. Researching is awesome, reading is awesome, but reading a book is not, is not really true action. You can read 10, 15, 20, 50 books, you still haven't done anything if you don't apply it. So you literally have to pull the trigger on whatever it is you want to do and start taking baby steps towards it. Otherwise, you'll never get there. Exactly. These are some great answers, gentlemen. Let me ask you this. Um, <laughs> what about the pitfalls? What would you share with us and these other millennials that's with you in your age about the pitfalls? Have you fallen into pitfalls yourself? And how did you climb out? Mm -hmm. And uh, if so, how would you avoid those and share that with others? Yeah, uh, pitfalls is what made me who I am. I, f I fell into a bunch of pitfalls. Everybody's going to fall into pitfalls. That's what life is, you know what I mean? But to what I would say to the younger people, even to the millennials of our age group, people of your age group, whoever, embrace those pitfalls. Don't run from them. Don't hide from them. Go straight on. Hit that head on. Don't run from the pitfalls because... It's going to tell you who you are. You're either going to be the person that make it out the pitfall or you're going to be the person that lay down and be like, you know what, it's too hard, I can't do that. Nah, embrace that pitfall. Right. Go for it. You know, so that's going, that's going to determine who you really are as a human being. Kind of man up. You got to. Right. You got to go through it head on, you right. know, so embrace yes. the pitfall. Don't, don't run from it. What say you, Marquez? I say pitfalls, um, it, it builds your emotional bank account. And that's like usually that. where, where people fall short is you know they don't have the confidence or they don't have the inner strength to prevail so pitfalls definitely build that up and if you can come out of a situation you're going to be stronger for it and it really is not a loss or, or a pitfall it's really a lesson mm -hmm. and usually i know life throws things at you but i'm a believer a lot of things that happen to us in some way we're responsible for so you kind of have to take ownership of those things sometimes even things that aren't really directly your fault, if you can embrace it and just know that you're going to change your situation or you're going to prevail, then you're, you're going to come out on top. No one, I, I, have, to quote, um, I have to quote one of my mentors, uh, no one who's ever given 100% has not come out on top, eventually. Mm -hmm. awesome. I like that. I, li I, like, I like that. I like that. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What about the fair sex involved in your your climb do you let that get in the way or if, you know having relationships girlfriends and significant others mm -hmm. how does that impact your your rise your climb to where you're mm -hmm. trying to achieve That's oh a good question that, that is a good question but I believe I believe in, in having a queen you know so like I got a queen right now and right. whatever whatever I go through she with, right there with me you know like for this interview she in the car right now waiting whatever I go through I keep mine with me so if she a real queen, if she a real woman that's, that's going to be by my side, she's going to go through anything that I go through, you know. Or, or if they're not trying to go through the hardships, the pitfalls with me, mm -hmm. then they're not real. They're not then they're not meant to be. Right. Then, then you don't need that. That's not a queen. A real queen going to be by your side. Like I said, she in the car right now. That's a lean, huh? Yeah. Not a queen. <laughs> <laughs> she, whatever. Hey, Marcus? Yeah, I have to second that with the, with the queen. There's a difference between, you know, just a regular woman and a queen because mm -hmm. they... They operate in the, and they think in a, in a capacity of royalty. So they understand, you know, they, they have to, it's not even just a, a, a uplifting, it's just, it's just you, you're bouncing off of each other's energy. But I do think that before, it, it can be a distraction if you allow it to be. Because if you have a woman who's not really truly supporting you, she's going to stray your attention. And so she's going to kind of distract you from the things that you need to be doing. So if she's emotionally strong, you're emotionally strong, she's not going to allow just the regular things that go on in a relationship to stray you from your goal and your vision or from hers. Right. Oh, yeah. How, how, do you, how do you impact your boys, you know, your homies, mm -hmm. and bring them back when they, they go astray, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, refocus them because that that's basically how we mentor mm -hmm. um, and pull out support group with us or 
away from us. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, if you don't want somebody negative bringing you down, so how, how, do, you, how do you deal with that? Uh, well, oh, oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, I say that's something I had a little bit a hard time with until maybe the past two years. So I'm a firm believer now that if someone is, is just really uh, bringing negative energy into your life, whether it be friends, family, um, how, however close they are, sometimes you kind of have to separate yourself from those people. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It doesn't mean that you hate them or don't like them. It's just you are focused on your vision. You're trying to do what you need to do for yourself and your family, and they're not going to do it. So if they're not right there with you mentally, or, or above you to mm -hmm. where they're pulling you up and you notice that, it's time to kind of separate yourself. Right. Now the friends that, that may happen to kind of go astray a little bit, I think you still, you need to, you need to be you know, there for them and, and you know, try to pull them back, keep them mm -hmm. focused, and they should be doing the same to you because everybody loses sight right. somewhat. Yeah. Um, but the ones who you just notice, and we all know deep down who those people are, whether it's your mom, your dad, your brother, and if they're not really supporting you and they're just kind of a negative drain, it's time to separate yourself from them. Right. Good answer. Good answer. Yeah. Uh, no, ab absolutely. Exactly what uh, Mark said. I agree with that. Uh, what I try to do is, even if, because I got friends that have been deemed negative by a lot of people because they was in a bad situation, you know, but they were the best of friends to me. Right. You know, like I said, my, my, my homie that's doing life for a murder right now, what he did is wrong. I don't condone that. But there was times when I was hungry and he was we was pulling up at the Burger King. I got you okay. chicken sandwich, fries, whatever you need. I got you, you know. So to in my eyes, he was an amazing person. But I wish I would have been there earlier to show him a different light. Where I'm from, you can either rap, play ball or sell drugs. That's your outlet. And basketball, football, that got an age limit on it. If you don't hit that by like 25, it's a wrap. It's a wrap for you. Not everybody gonna make it in a rap game. We need better options. We need we better do. options, sure. but but like what I'm trying to do is this film. You know, there's a bunch, there's a hundred people working on production. So if I could show them a different light, if I could get them out there in Hollywood, show them a different light, come be a part of something positive that we sending messages through, then that that might alter their pathway. You know what I mean? That might alter what they doing in life because they haven't been shown a different life. And there's a saying I don't I don't know if I have it quite right about. You can't, you may bring them to the dance, mm -hmm. but you can't always leave with them. Mm -hmm. And, or, you know, a friendship sometimes is only for a season. Everybody's not meant to stay there. That's a fact. True. And, True. and so we have to recognize that as we, as we grow. I've had to recognize it myself. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be a painful and hurtful thing. Yeah. You know, but, you know, it's always something to keep in mind and inspire you as you move on in your life. So let me ask you something. What really makes you angry with millennials, uh, the kids your age, young people, and the kids you know, your age. What, what makes you angry that, well, they, that, they're, that they're doing or not doing? Yeah, the, the, the thing that really uh, kind of upsets me or frustrates me is the fact that a lot of young people or millennials don't know about their history, their culture, especially like a lot of black people. When I see a lot of black kids who don't know about Emmett Till, Marcus Garvey, they don't know about uh, uh, like uh, Martin, well, they they kind of know about Martin Luther King, but they don't really know everything. They don't really know the Malcolm X. They don't really know where they're coming from right. when it comes from slavery. You know what I mean? They don't and know about a, Africa. That's a whole start point. Yeah, they don't right. know about Africa. I took my nephew, who's like 11 years old, to the African American Museum. I asked him, "Do you know who enslaved us?" He don't know. Oh, wow. He don't know because they're not teaching that in the yeah, history. Well, they're not to school anyway. Yeah, yeah they they not they not learning that. So that that's. That's what frustrates me, and I don't really think it's their fault. I think it's got to be up to us to to put those resources back in our community and teach our our young black millennials and young black kids about what's really going on. Right. You know, so so that's what frustrates me. Like daily, I see it right. daily. Wow. What about you, Marcus? Uh, millennials overall, or just the younger kids, is just the the social dynamic. It's just how how they communicate these days it's like they it's, it's no longer how we're sitting here and just really able to have a full-on discussion you know with deeper topics other than shallow things it's, mm -hmm. it's everything is revolved around social media likes and I feel like me and him come from a generation where we still 
got to see the old aspect. We like I I don't know about you. I remember yeah, yeah. when there really wasn't cell phones or there <laughs> wasn't, wasn't internet or you know what I mean. Like so, we still remember those Am things. Am I that old? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I remember you know you had your your your, little, your pages, your cell phone. So I remember looking at uh, you teaching me how to read a map. I remember, yeah. you know, even when it started to transform, we still had to go on map quests. <laughs> you know, you know yeah. what I mean? So now <laughs> everything, yes, right. everything is so quick, people are impatient too. Yeah. And then within the black community, uh, it is definitely the history aspect. And um, even though in some ways we are learning because we have instant in information, mm -hmm. and that's how I started to learn about our, our community. Um, was you know just through my own reading through reading online there's a lot of kids who just don't take the time to do that and that that's another thing which is kind of like a it's comparable is we have access to so much information and people are not using it wisely it's, do you think that you just put down cell phones and for a while you know at times you know like mandate some time each day just put it down you give your brain a relaxing moment and focus on either the, the, the positive or just having a conversation, picking up a phone, actually real talk. What do you think about that? I think uh, I think that's I think that's good. I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a way to incorporate different things and different outlooks on outlooks on life. But um, I mean, technology is going to be here. It's going to keep growing. It's going to keep growing and advancing. You know what I mean? So like, I wouldn't say put the cell phone down per se, but I would say look at different. Like he said, the internet is there 30 seconds you can learn a ton of information so use that cell phone for something constructive something good you know so learn something I, that's that would be my advice i don't say you have to put the internet down i just think you have to utilize it to best enhance you mm -hmm. um i would say everyone i think everyone should allocate a little bit of time it doesn't have to be daily but it's mm -hmm. just times like uh i've had experiences especially not not to shade but women i feel like sometimes have a harder time like they like sometimes they can't just enjoy the moment everything has to dates. be yeah everything has to be documented so it's just that's I, I, true Ron. yeah everything has it's to true. be documented everything has to be a video or Food, picture what i ate uh -huh. I do it and, and, yeah and i took a trip i took a trip uh with my with uh my son and i remember we were in, in um at, at disney world in, in florida and i'm trying to you know take a video of these animals and I realized by trying to take a video I really was missing everything because I was trying to take a video of it and I just put it down and sometimes you got to just you know take a hike with your friends or your your, your significant other or mm -hmm. do something and put the phone away put it in the bag like just enjoy the moment without trying to record it right. because you will actually have a better a better like visual or vivid memory of it yourself without having to look at something let me have to have serious question are you afraid as black men in the streets of Los Angeles being shot by police officers if you're stopped? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid every day being a black man in America, period. I'm from the South. Out here is way different. I'm from the South where it's black and white. You know, like there was times when I was 16, 17, coming home from a basketball court, cops pull up. Where your ID at? Where you coming from? Sir, I got a ball. I'm coming from the court. Nah, we won't, we, won't, we won't buy that. Get in the back of the paddy wagon. Get in the back of the van. You know, the paddy wagon, they put you in the right. back with a bunch of other kids and, and stuff like that. So you're going uptown. Yeah. You know, like, that. that's that's my environment growing up. That happened more than one occasion. More than one occasion I've been behind bars. You know what I mean? So, like, yeah, I'm afraid of being a black man in America because, like, guess what? Dressing like this or, or, or like, having a hoodie on, you are subject to death. And you, you are right now dressed just like middle America, anyone. It don't matter. You know? You're subject to death because of the way you look and the way your pigment is right. on your skin. You, 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 it's, a, it's, it's a very real thing, you know what I mean? But you always got to act accordingly to try and avoid that stuff. Right. But some stuff is, is unavoidable. True. True. Mm. What about you, Marcus? Uh, my dynamics definitely going to be different because, like I said, I, I'm born and bred out here. So I'm not going to say I'm afraid. I'm, I'm definitely aware because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you are as a black man. You still see a squad car. You're still going to give it the eye. You're still going to look in the mirror. You're still going to think about what you're doing. And then sometimes you got to calm yourself just like, you know, relax. Um, but, yeah, living out here definitely is different. I'm not going to say those things haven't happened. I mean, I've had a couple experiences, but not 
to the same level as you have. Mm -hmm. And I understand that happens in other places because I, you know, I have family from the yeah. South. Truck uh, one, I stayed by 63%. Exactly. <laughs> right. so, I, I, so I already know, and I've seen things even like being in other states kind of briefly, or, or I went to school briefly in Atlanta, even though that's a predominantly black city. Oh, it's still happening. I, I, that was probably my, my biggest experience of black and white. Yeah. Because being from where I am out here, it's such a melting it's a pot. Melt, it's it's so, beautiful, though. Yeah, it's, it's definitely beautiful, so you don't get treated necessarily with the same aggression all the mm. time, as if I know if I'm walking in a certain place in Georgia, or, if, or you know what I mean? What would you do to tell other young men how to keep themselves safe um, from being shot w what steps would you give them I would say I was definitely taught very well uh, and I also have family you know that that were um, ex ex police officers uh, so I would say you have to maintain just just be very calm and you don't in regardless I know there's racial uh, constructs which these officers go by but Remember, they're still human, and you don't know, no matter how racist this person is, you don't know what kind of day he had. If he had a good day, you might be getting a pass. If he had a bad day, you might not be if you say the wrong thing. So it's, you still have to recognize that you're not going to smack a, a pit bull in the face. You're just going to treat it, you know, you're going to act accordingly. So you just got to be calm. Even if it, they're pulling you over for some mess, you need to not get rowdy. You need to, you know, move slowly. You know, ask, say, hey, you know, I'm going to give you my ID. If you're going to pull something out from a compartment, mm -hmm. tell them what you're doing. So it's no surprise. So they can't, you know, get you with that and still know the basic laws. Because should no one pull you out your car and, and search your car for something, something minute. Yeah, right. I would uh, capitalize on that and say uh, exactly. Try to remain calm. I mean, that's, that's the main thing. Try to remain calm, trying to be compliant as far as, like, your mannerism saying yes sir, no sir. I mean, let's, it's, it's no secret. We got to go the extra mile. We got to go the extra mile. We got to really be courteous to these mm -hmm. people because they are afraid of us. That's crazy. They don't want with the gun, but they're afraid of us, you know, because we've been deemed as the super predators, you know, ever since the Clinton era or whatever. But like, stay calm. Try to use your mannerisms. Be respectful. And just, if they take you to jail, man, just go to jail, man. Just try and fight it, the legal system, even mm -hmm. though it's not set up for us. But fight it another day. Better to live. Lawyer and live. To live. But sometimes, that don't even work. As you can see with Philando Castile, yeah, when he was seat belt buckled up, exactly. told the officer, I have a registered gun in here. And we still got the shots fired into Philando, mm -hmm. so. Well, let's end on this positive note. Let me ask you quickly, in the next 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. What do you want to be in five years, both of you? You want to go first? Uh, yeah, five years, I just see myself, um, you know, having multiple businesses and, and really having, uh, I'm a big, big advocate for just freedom, freedom, financial freedom, freedom of time, freedom to make your own decisions. And you? I'm going to be on top of the world. Right. That's all I need to say. I'm going to be on top of the world. Well, I love it. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming in. These are mentorship moments, and we look forward to your great success in life. And... We'll be back again for Mentorships Moments Returns. Look for us. I'm your host, Mark E. Ridley, actor, director, filmmaker. And uh, we thank you for joining us. We we're going to see you again very soon. Take care. Uh, okay.